So in the last section, we saw that decisions are not always based on an informed sort of rational cost-benefit analysis. And in addition to the um, loss aversion and prospect theory that we've just seen, people also make heuristics, which are sort of mental shortcuts that people make to sort of take snap decisions. So you only have one chance for a first impression. People use a very large set of heuristics, and I'm going to describe the three that are very important for decision making. The first one is the availability heuristic. The second one is the representativeness heuristic. And the third one is the anchoring heuristic. So to start with the availability heuristic, that is the ease with which a particular concept can be brought to mind. For example, because it's been in the media a lot. So when a very infrequent event happens, uh, but it can be thought of easily, this heuristic is very likely to be overestimated of happening. So for example, terrorist attack. The chance of actually dying in a terrorist attack is very small. You're more likely to die whenever you just cross the street when you came to work this morning. Um, and the same goes for shark killings. Because every shark killing is in the news, we are relatively scared of sharks. However, the chance of you dying in your bathtub is actually larger than getting killed by a shark. The second heuristic that we use is the representative um, heuristic, um, which means that we try to match people to prototypes and we estimate the likelihood that a person falls into a certain category. So, for example, if you read a description about um, a person who uh, went to university, uh, works in academia, is interested in why people do what they do, um, always cycles to work, and when she's at work, she eats a sandwich with Gouda cheese. Um, this is sort of the description about this person and then you are asked to sort of estimate the likelihood of this person being a psychologist or the likelihood that this person is Dutch. Another group of people will be asked what is the likelihood that this person is a Dutch psychologist and because all of the characteristics that I've just described might sort of fit in with the view that you might have of a Dutch psychologist and people are likely to sort of overestimate the chance that this person is a Dutch psychologist. Although we know from base rates that the likelihood of someone being a psychologist is higher than this being a psychologist plus something else, being Dutch. So this heuristic can actually cause people to sort of ignore base rates and overestimate the chance that someone belongs to a certain category. The last heuristic I would like to mention is anchoring, and it has to do with estimating numbers. And when you estimate a number, it's actually being influenced by um, previous numbers that you have encountered. And the interesting thing is that this even occurs when the previous number has nothing to do with the number you now have to estimate. So for example, um, if I would ask you to guess how what the percentage of women is in computer science, and before answering this question, I will give you a book. And I will ask you how many pages does this book have? And some people will give a very thick book with a high number of pages, and some people will give a very thin book then the people that I gave a thick book will actually estimate that more women work in computer science than the people that received a small book. So the idea is that even if something is not related, if you've just said out loud a higher number, you're sort of anchoring it, and therefore if you then need to say another number, you're more likely to increase your estimate. And this is how discounts work. Whenever you see sale on the shop window, what it actually does is it's anchoring the original price, the higher price, and showing you the new price, which looks better because it's better than the old price. So if you have a discount from £20 to £15, 25% off that must be good. Whilst if the same item was just priced £15, you might be less likely to buy it. So heuristics are very useful in some situations. <laughs> Whenever you see a lion, you might just want to act and not sit down and think about all your options. But the problem of heuristics is that it also makes us sort of prone to systematic bias and biases and errors. And a cognitive bias is sort of the persistent pattern of deviation and judgment, so how you're not being rational. And biases affect how people perceive the world and therefore the type of decisions they make and how they're going to behave. Um, the interesting thing to know about cognitive biases is that they can occur during different stages of information processing. So for example, whenever you're paying attention to things, whenever you're interpreting information, whenever you're storing it into memory, and whenever you're trying to retrieve it from memory. 
The three biases that I'll be explaining to you now that have to do with decision making are the fundamental attribution error, hindsight bias and the confirmation bias. So the first one is the fundamental attribution error, and that's the tendency to overemphasize personality-based explanations for behaviors that you see in others, and not in yourself, who also tends to sort of overestimate the good things we do in ourselves to our personality. Um, but whenever we talk about other people, um, we sort of tend to ignore context and circumstances and we try to blame the person. So for example, um, whenever um, someone tried to make an online bank transfer, but typed in the name of their bank incorrectly, and at that moment it was a fake website, they put in their bank details, and the next day they find out that their entire life savings are gone. Because it's behavior in someone else, people might actually, um, instead of saying they're unlucky, or they have very um, sort of bad circumstances, people are actually likely to sort of start saying that this person was negligent or maybe they weren't very clever. Uh, and this can lead to victim blaming. So the idea is that you're sort of overemphasizing personality rather than context. The second bias is the hindsight bias, which is also called the I knew it all along effect. And that's a tendency to sort of see past events, so things that have happened, as being predictable once you know the outcome. So we all know that the Titanic uh, unfortunately sank. So whenever we think about the decision of the captain to keep going, or even increase speed, we now think that's a stupid decision. But we know what happened, the captain didn't. And again, this can lead to victim blaming. For example, if a girl in the evening works, uh, sort of walks home through a slightly dodgy neighborhood by herself, um, if we know that it actually ended badly, we're more likely to say that that was a stupid decision. Um, than if we didn't know that it ended badly. The last one is the confirmation bias, and that's the tendency to sort of both search for information and also interpret information in a way that confirms your already existing beliefs. So information that you come across that doesn't support what you already believed, you can actually get rid of, it can be discredited. And what this does is that it reduces critical thinking and actually can create tunnel vision. And this is a very big problem in police investigations, because if the police is already sort of um, quite certain that a suspect have done it, they might actually start looking for information and interpreting information in this manner, and thereby not paying attention to information that um, shows that this person may not have done it. So what this all leads to is bounded rationality. Because the expected utility theory that we discussed in the first section assumes that people behave rationally. However, this is often not the case in, in practice because people, uh, whenever they're making um, decisions, um, they do this based on limited available information using heuristics and there are certain biases associated with using those heuristics. And this creates, instead of a more objective rationality, it creates a bounded rationality based on the person. So bounded rationality can explain why people behave irrationally. And everything I've talked about so far is about what happens internally. It is all interpersonal processes. However, we don't live in a bubble where it's just us individuals. We live in a social world and we keep sort of communicating and interacting with other people. And these people can influence our decisions as well. So these are called the interpersonal decisions. And they're influenced by social uh, factors. And just to sort of show you how much of an impact other people can actually have in our decision making. I'm going to give you two examples from the social psychology literature. And the first one um, is by Ash in 1958. And he did a conformity study because he was really interested to find out how people sort of conform under social pressure. So what he did is he invited a participant to the lab. And this participant was sitting at a table with other people. The participant thought that the other people were also participants, but in real life they were actually confederates. Um, helpers of the experimenter. And what the participant had to do is they had to sort of solve very easy tasks that everyone can answer. But instead of being interested in knowing if someone can solve these easy tasks, Ash was interested to see what happens if other people give the wrong answer. Do you conform, uh, con sort of do you conform and um, do what other people were doing or do you still give the right answer? Um, so what he found is that actually 74%, almost three quarters of the people, conformed at least once to an incorrect answer 
because other people were giving that answer. And they also explained that they weren't doing this because they thought that this answer was correct, but because they were afraid of social stigmatization. A second experiment that I would like to explain is a Milgram shock experiment. And this happened sort of just after the Second World War, 1963. And they were inspired by Nazis and doing things that people thought were terrible. And they wanted to know if Nazis were just really bad people or if maybe good people can do bad things under the circum or under um, specific circumstances. So what they did is there were three people involved, the participant, the experimenter, and someone that the participant thought was another participant, but again was actually confederate. And the experimenter would instruct the participant to give very painful electrical shocks to the other person. And Milgram asked up front to people, how likely do you think it is that people will give the full amount of shocks? So it would be sort of shocks of increasing um, height, starting off very low and ending up with 450 volts, which is a lot. And people thought, well, almost no one will do that, maybe 1%. And what turned out to happen is that 65% of the participants actually gave all the shocks. So that was much higher than what people expected. So in 1984, Cialdini sort of established six principles of how we can sort of be affected by other people and how they can influence our decisions. And what you need to understand is that these principles can be used for good and for bad. On the one hand, they're used for marketing and consumer psychology, but at the moment they're also being used by fraudsters and scammers, because it means you can change someone else's behavior. And the first of the six principles is reciprocity, and that's the idea that people aim to return favors. By doing someone else a favor, you sort of increase the likelihood of them doing a favor to you back. And whenever we're talking about a, a scam context, um, scammers sometimes sort of first transfer a small amount of money into someone's account, the potential victim, um, before they ask the victim to return the favor. So they first do something, and then based on reciprocity principle, they expect something back. The second uh, principle is commitment and consistency. Once people start something, they'd like to continue. That's the idea of having a foot in the door. Um, so for example, the scammer can start by asking you to do something very small that you don't mind doing, but by doing something small, you actually increase the likelihood of doing bigger things later. So once people are committed, they're more likely to continue. The third principle is liking. People are more likely to be influenced by people they like than by people they don't like. And you can make yourself more likable by being friendly or sort of being more similar to the person or more familiar. So the more you've seen someone, the more you'll start to like them. So a scammer, for example, can start by building rapport and being friendly to you, or can actually highlight similarities between him and you. Uh, for example, in the lonely heart swindles. Authority. And people often sort of feel a sense of obligation towards people in an authority position. And those can be signaled by things like uniforms or titles or status symbols like expensive cars. And what we've seen a lot is that scammers try to refer to their lawyer saying, I don't necessarily want you to do this, but my lawyer really insists or they pretend to be a relative of a very rich and powerful person, like a Nigerian widow. Um, then we have scarcity, because the idea is that people are more attractive when their availability is limited. For example, this, ex this offer will expire soon, or this is the last one. And what we saw when we were investigating real estate scams, when people are offering uh, real estate for rent that they don't actually own, is that scammers kept telling us um, to act very quickly because other people are interested in the property as well. So you need to decide now. The last one I want to mention is social proof. Um, and that's especially under uncertain circumstances when you don't know what to do, people look around and see what other people are doing. And they will use that information to decide how they're going to behave themselves. And th this is something you can see in pyramid schemes, chain letters, and swindles that are now promoted on social networks. So you see other people doing it, so you're more likely to engage in it yourself as well. So the future of social persuasion. Um, we now live in a world where people with enough followers on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube are themselves sort of being used as advertisement campaigns because they're provided with free goods in exchange for publicity. 
So what is the future of fraud in a world where automated systems can quickly turn popularity into financial success?